What tool do you think resides in this beautiful mahogany case? Let's take a look. Stand by for more. Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube slash internet shop teacher. This time with a special tool given to me by Michael Epstein out of the great state of California. And of all things, and I thank you Michael, it's a beautiful speed counter or revolution counter made by Brown and Sharp. So in this video I intend to demonstrate its use talk a little bit about it, matter of fact a lot about it, take it apart, show you how it works, and I hope you enjoy the video. Isn't that a beautiful tool? This is a Brown and Sharp number 748 speed indicator. And there's different names for the speed counter, revolution counter, but Brown and Sharp calls it a speed indicator. And it's uh, in darn near mint condition. Patented in 1922. I'm not sure what year this was made. Probably a lot more recently than that. And near the end of the video, I'm going to show you patent drawings. and I'm going to show you a lot of other pictures. So be sure and watch those uh, pictures at the end. The purpose of speed counters, and I have a bunch of them, is to determine the RPM of a shaft or a pulley or a machine and these must always be used in conjunction with a watch. So it really takes two hands to, to, to make that measurement. And once they came up with uh, instruments such as this Stuart Warner tachometer that was direct reading, these pretty much went by the wayside. But there must be millions of these still out there uh, in people's toolboxes and uh, all around the country and uh, people collect these. They made uh, many many different styles and in another video I might show some of the other patents for these, some of which probably never got into production. Here's a picture of a machine shop many years ago and in most of these shops the machinery was driven by line shafts overhead so you can see that there are belts and pulleys galore and everyone has to be set at a certain speed and has to be measured for whatever cutting speeds these machines require. It must have been terribly noisy in some of these factories with the belts slapping around and uh, oil and grease and bits of leather flying. This is a view of the crankshaft department at the Ford Motor Company when they were making Model T's. Look at all the belts and pulleys. All of those bearings and shafts up there had to be lubricated from time to time and they usually employed boys to do that and they would crawl around in the rafters there and the joists doing their job and they looked like monkeys up in the jungle and that's where they got the term grease monkey. And there's the grease monkey talking to his boss. If you watch my videos regularly, you've seen me use these other tachometers in uh, some of my demonstrations. And more typically now, from the Far East, you can buy these digital type electronic tachometers. This type of speed counter is uh, put directly into the center hole on the end of a shaft or a motor shaft or a pulley shaft or whatever it is and that's how you get the reading and usually there's several different types of rubber tips that can be used as well. Looking at the face of the instrument you can see two arrows so you can use this uh, in either direction that is the motor shaft may run clockwise or it might run clockwise, uh, counterclockwise so you just use the appropriate a set of numbers for that. So the little digits here on the outside are for one hundreds and you can set that to zero with the knob here and there's a little bit of a ratchet so I would set that to zero and then each one of the graduations would be a hundred RPM 
and in the little windows would be from 0 to 100. So you're taking uh, two numbers and adding them together in 60 second time slot using your wristwatch or more typically years ago they were using a pocket watch. Okay, here's the pulley on the end of the hardened lathe and I'll simply put the tip into the center hole. I've removed the belt for safety purposes and I've zeroed the instrument out and I'm going to watch the second hand on my Timex. And here we go. I, of course, sped that up a little bit, but looking at the dial here now, you can see that I have measured 1,700 RPM plus what's in the window, and it reads 30 there. So it's 1,730, but there can be a little bit of an error right there depending on whether I engage it and disengage it at exactly the second mark. But at any rate, thanks to Mr. Tesla and General Electric, I know that that actual speed of the motor was 1750, so you can see this is right on. Now to speed things up, one could of course do it for 15 seconds or 30 seconds and do the math and come up with an equally good answer. Remember that often they were in uh, dark conditions or cold or dirty conditions where maybe they couldn't even read their watch properly. This gives just a little bit of a vibration every time, uh, in other words a pulse, every time the one 100 RPM is achieved. So I don't know if that was done on purpose so one could, uh, could do it in the dark but some of the sterrets have this little pimple on them that the engineer could feel with his thumb as it came around and he could count in his mind. Often the engineer was around electrical machinery when he was taking his measurements. That's why in some cases like in these sterrets this is rosewood handle which of course would be insulative as well as this hard rubber or Bakelite or whatever it is, again, on the Sterrett. But note here, in the, I know I'm telling you way too much here. In the original book here, the handle is some kind of hard rubber or Bakelite, but they changed the design at some point, and when you take the handle off, I'm going to take this whole thing apart if you'll bear with me, that is, if anyone is still watching. But there is a fiber washer that insulates the handle from the rest of the instrument. How cool is that? No, this isn't my grandpa's pocket watch when he worked on the railroad. This is a cheap piece of junk that was given to me at a wedding. You know how they give away a gift sometimes? And I hadn't used it in years. As a matter of fact, I've never used it. So I thought, well, I'll wind it up. No, nope, no dice. It's quartz, so I opened it up, and of course the battery was dead, and I had to laugh when it said Swiss parts. It doesn't say it's made in Switzerland. It says Swiss parts. And I've had this for quite a while, and offhand it's kind of a pretty uh, watch, isn't it? But it's, it's just junk. Okay, let's take this little beauty apart. I'm using a jeweler's screwdriver, and I will speed up the footage here just a little bit to reduce the boredom. All right, looking inside now, and by the way, this is a die casting. So it would be zinc, nickel plated. You see it's non-magnetic. Now why there? Because it's catching the screw and the pawl. But it's, it's die cast. Matter of fact, you can see the ejector pin marks there. 
and this little spring here and Paul right on that gear. Now needless to say if we look at this other brand all of these are worm gear type drives and in this one is visible without taking it apart. So there's the worm and there's the gear. Okay I'll take the shaft out which is held captive by this little screw. And the screw goes into this little groove here. There's the worm and the bearing on the other end, nothing special. And if you look on this piece, there's a screw there which allows you to take up end play. I will show you the patent at the end because it is well there's the patent date and that did coincide with what I found on the internet at the US Patent Office so that that is correct. I think the man's name was Parker. There's the dial. That also is non-magnetic. Uh, it's nickel plated brass and there are two rows, circular rows of numbers inner and outer for those little windows that we talked about earlier and on the back is the gear and that's outer gear there of course is for the worm am I showing you too much? And this inner gear, which isn't really a gear at all, is what the little, uh, it's a ratchet mechanism and this little pawl here is what it's activated on. But there's yet another part here yet, and you'll be kind of amazed at this. Let me take it apart if I can without losing anything. I shouldn't even do this. There's a little spring, but the beauty here is that spring is pushing against a tiny little brake shoe. Which gives it a little resistance. Now when I look at the patent drawing, it shows two of those. So I don't know if they change the design at some point, and there's the brake shoe. I don't want to lose it, I have to go down to Napa and get another one. But, and there's the spring. Looking carefully at this, you can see that there could be a brake shoe on each side and the patent shows that. I don't know if a part has been lost by someone else. I doubt it. I bet they just changed the design and realized we don't need two brake shoes. This isn't a deuce and a half truck for crying out loud. Now I will clean these parts and uh, then reassemble but I'm not going to show all the reassembly because I will be quite a fumbling old fool when I do that. But one other thing you must note here if I can find it. Alright the other thing I wanted to show you on the back side of this piece and I believe this is brass. Yeah that's brass. This is a magnet by the way there's a tiny little pin. Now the purpose of that pin is that each time it comes around, that it would be one revolution, it clicks on the little pawl here and advances by one revolution, this little plate. So that's the mechanism that moves the outer plate and you already see it's the worm that moves the inner piece that I'm holding right now. Alright, you've seen everything there is.
and I probably showed you more than you want to know. Now as I put this together, oh one other thing here, on the pawl there's a little groove, almost like a V-groove on the back side, and that spring has to be in that as I assemble it. And of course I will use a little bit of the stirred oil, which is blasphemous to be using on a brown and sharp product. So if this is the brake shoe, and it is, this is the brake drum inside. And as I can, as far as I can tell, it's just to provide some resistance or friction. And there it is, good as new. Hope you enjoyed the video. This is Tubal Kane saying so long and I'll see you next time.